everyone. We are joined by author Dennis Crosby, author of the urban fantasy novel Death's Legacy, which we spoke about here on Cheers Dears last week. And tonight, we're speaking with him about his upcoming release, Death's Debt. Dennis, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So happy to be here. Now, I'm so glad you are here because I just finished reading Death's Debt and I loved it so much. (laughs) I actually screamed no at the very end (laughs) because he left us with not just one cliffhanger, but several. Oh my gosh. And now listeners, I assure you, this is a no spoiler zone, which is going to be really hard (laughs) um, because this is my first time getting to talk to Dennis about this, but it was, it was such a great fast high tension right from the get-go story and it really just swept you off your feet and into this world that you've created yeah and um before i keep keep going would you like to tell us <laughs> tell us a little bit more about Dustet? well let me first say thank you for that because this this is my, it's my second novel and I've heard from so many writers that the sophomore novel can be the hardest um, <clears throat> because you're trying to kind of capture that magic you had in the first novel and you want it to be at least as good as that one and you're second guessing yourself throughout. I have been second guessing myself on Death's Dead up until like five minutes ago. Um, so the fact that you that you liked it uh, just means a lot. It just helps me realize that I'm, I'm in the right place with that with that book um so yeah death debt it it takes place pretty much right after death legacy um we are looking at probably about maybe three four weeks after the events of death legacy and you know cassidy is just kind of in this space she she beat the bad guy she she got the the weapon that she needed she is now ascended she's she's achieved this godhood but she doesn't still really know what that means for her. You know, she spent most of the last book trying to come to terms with who she is, um, or at least accept who she is. So now that she's accepted that and she's been able to ascend, now she's got to really understand what it means to be her and what it means to kind of carry this mantle. And for her, it's, it's, it's still challenging. She's got no real guidance you know she's got her friends of course but she's a little upset with them right now because of the events of the last book um and she's again she's like she feels like she's trying to find her way through this all by herself she's kind of navigating these waters with with no lifeline uh so yeah so this book is really about her she's already again she's already kind of accepted who she is now she's got to understand what that means and accept that part of herself and get through those those trials uh, while people are, are gunning for her again she's got two folks after her this time and it's 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 kind of tense as you said <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's the first book was also very high high speed fast paced story sure. and I, you start us right off with a bang <laughs> and definitely a little bit of fire um and if first... people can get through the first chapter they're going to be good in this book the first chapter is um <laughs> it, it, there's a lot happening right there and, and it was it was difficult to write because i'm feeling the things that the character is feeling in that it's got kind of that cringy moment, you know, at one point I actually toned it down. So if, if folks can get through that, that first chapter, the rest is smooth sailing. <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm coming from a horror writing background, so it didn't phase me at all, but I was like, Oh, <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, Dennis, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of an insight into that. And mm-hmm. last week we we focused on how um, with Cassidy she's a big whiskey drinker and she has all these different vices. But one of the main themes of this show here is to share our signature drinks. Indeed. So last week with Death's De- or Death's Legacy, uh, the signature drink was Elijah Craig small small barrel small batch small batch. Yeah. And this week is Brothers Bond. Brothers Bond. You want to tell us a little bit about those? Well, so with each each book, I've 
I don't always drink when I write, <laughs> but <laughs> for the record. Um, but when I do, um, I do, you know, I, I'll typically kind of stick with one throughout the course of the writing of that book because I, I kind of associate it with, with the story. Mm -hmm. So with Death's Legacy, Elijah Craig was one that um, it just kind of, it was like a recurring theme for me. It seemed like everywhere I was, it was like calling me. It became kind of the drink of the week for a while. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'll be sipping this. And um, it, it comes up uh, frequently in, in Death's Legacy and it just kind of fit that tone. Um, Cassidy loves her bourbon. She's, she's definitely a whiskey gal. I don't want to kind of, you know, glorify the drinking part because she does struggle with it a little bit, but I think she functions still with it as well. She's got some, some very special tastes and she kind of, she snaps at one of her, not snaps, but talks to her mentor about how, her, how she feels about a certain thing. He presented her with a, with a um, high end bourbon and she could taste the difference. Like she knows, she knows her stuff um, probably more than I do. And I actually created her. So that's, that's a thing. That's really fun. With, with Brothers Bond, this particular bourbon came out just as I was like in the middle of writing Death's Debt. Um, I had started it toward the end of last year and I put it away for a little bit, kind of looking for some inspiration. And I started kind of digging back into it in the springtime. And it was right around the time that Brothers Bond bourbon came out. And I special ordered, I pre-ordered a couple bottles because they put it on, on uh, special before it came out. And it came in, and I tell you, the first sip was like, "This is this is a dangerous drink. <laughs> it is it is tasty. It's got good color, um, and you can literally, I mean, you can sit for an evening and just just have a few of those." And it helped me write. I'm not going to say more, but it helped me write. Like it was one of those times where I'd come home from work, I'd need to unwind. And it, it's a good bourbon kind of like to have to sip on throughout the course of the week because it's not it's not too strong mm -hmm. and overpowering um, that it just knocks you off your butt. <laughs> um, but it, it, it flows well. And uh, the reason that I, I was interested in the first place, um, it is created by um, Ian Summerholder and Paul Wesley. They were the main characters of the Vampire Diaries uh, series. They play da Damon and Stefan, uh, vampire brothers. Uh, they apparently are still friends because they have now founded a bourbon company <laughs> um, called Brothers Bond. And they've been advertising this thing forever. And, you know, there's been all kinds of uh, promotion and commercial. They're on Instagram. They're, they're just all over the right. place. In, in the series, um, Vampire Diaries, the, the two characters drink bourbon throughout this, the course of this series, and they talked about the fact that they drink it because it helps kind of fight off the bloodlust. And I thought that was a really interesting take on why they would be drinking that. And at that time, I wasn't a bourbon drinker. I, I didn't even think, I thought it was too hard for me. At that time, I was still kind of a craft beer guy. And it wasn't until maybe five, six years ago that I really started to get into bourbon. And so when they came out with theirs, I'm like, probably very fitting for me to try this because they were kind of the catalyst for me even thinking or considering trying bourbon at some point in my life. And I was very pleased to find that this um, was just as, as tasty as it is. And because it's Brothers Bond, it's just a good kind of familial theme with the, with the name of the bourbon. And both Death's Legacy and Death's Debt have some familial themes within um, I won't spoil either one of the books for those that might not have read either of them. Um, but there are a lot of family connections within the stories. And it seems fitting, I think, that that Brothers Bond be kind of that drink that's associated with, with this second book. Um, there's some more family pieces coming in. There's some family secrets that are in there. Um, and then, you know, the series is going to go on because, as you said, I, I left people with several cliffhangers. If I don't write those books, I'm sure those folks will come after me hardcore. As so, is yeah. their right. I mean, <laughs> you can't leave. I would like expect that. nothing less. 
<laughs> it's so true. Um, but, you know, it's there were several really good points in there. Um, for starters, listeners, most of us authors are not alcoholics. We just enjoy something as we write. And <laughs> it's it's really interesting that you you said something that really calls to me as well. A um, couple weeks ago, by the time this podcast airs, um, someone asked me on TikTok what my signature drink is. And I had to go through this whole soul searching thing because I didn't know what my signature mm -hmm. drink was because, you know, why would I have that while doing this podcast? And, <clears throat> excuse me, it came down to me realizing exactly that, that every single story I wrote had something a little different and that sure. each one of those sort of represented me. And so, yeah. you know, I enjoy gin. I enjoy whiskey. I enjoy... Um, I enjoy rum, I enjoy wine, but it, the ones that I typically have with me as I write are whiskey uh -huh. or wine. And uh -huh. and it kind of goes like what you said um, about how there's something about just having that little, that little something at the end of the day to help you through. Because when it's 9 a.m. and I'm writing, I have coffee or tea with me. Uh, exactly. <laughs> don't tend to be as productive, but um, <laughs> but I, I wonder if a part of it is that you know alcohol tends to help us loosen up and relax, and we're not as hung up, we're not as reluctant to put something down. Just how it kind of makes us loose lipped, maybe it right makes yeah. us a little bit looser with the the keyboard as we go, or the pen, or whatever it is. I think there's something to that because when I write, there are times when I'm concerned about the things, the, the content. After reading chapter one, it's probably hard to imagine that I'm worried about content, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I I do think about that a lot in some chapters. And there were some some chapters that I actually just completely deleted because I thought they were too intense. I thought that it might... Uh, touch a few too many mm. nerves and I don't I don't want to turn people off um, but at the same time I want the story to be fun I want it's urban fantasy so it should be should have that fantastical element and I don't want to have that that governor as I'm writing I want to be able to just go out and do it and kind of lose the inhibitions and then you know I'll edit later or you know fine tune it later but I think you know after you you come home from that from that long day and you're going to write some you know having that drink i think does kind of help like you're saying i think it helps relax those those muscles those filters because if you're going to write you know you want to be honest with what you're writing you want to be honest with what you're feeling you want to be honest with your what your characters are experiencing too and you can do that a little bit more if you're not worried about you know, somebody kind of looking over your shoulder, reading or that voice in the back of your head says, don't write mm. that. Don't put that in there. People are going to be upset. Um, you know, you can worry about that part, that part in editing, just get it all out. And I think that the, a couple sips here and there will definitely help with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, now listeners, if you're under 21 or, or you're, you're not someone who drinks alcohol, which of course is no judgment. That's well and good find something that gets you into that mindset. You know, whether it's a cup of tea or the comfiest couch you ever did sit in, you know, mm -hmm. just something that gets you to relax. And, yeah. and like Dennis said, just to release those inhibitions. And I think that's something that so many of us creatives really get trapped up in is our own insecurities of questioning oh crap was that good enough am i good enough mm -hmm. am i really a writer or i'm just kind of an imposter <laughs> and this is something that we see come up in both of your books this this mm -hmm. idea of this imposter syndrome and something that cassidy struggles with and that actually i would say quite a few of your characters were dealing with and um that was something that i think is really coming up a lot here in current discussions i've been hearing it all over the place. And mm -hmm. I think it's so important that we address this as creatives. Absolutely. And would Absolutely. you like to expand on that? Yeah. You know, I, I think for the last couple of years, imposter syndrome, this, this thought that you're, you're putting yourself against someone else who's 
been at a craft for a longer time. You know, for me, it's comparing myself to another author that has reached some kind of pinnacle of success and thinking as I'm writing, I'm never going to be that good. I'm not that good. Why am I doing this? Why am I even bothering? The funny thing is that I've heard from New York Times bestselling authors, LA Times bestselling authors. I've heard from authors whose books have gone to film, to television, uh, they feel it too with every book that they write. They're, they're, they think that every the next book that they write is going to sink their career. I think we all have that because we're always trying to, we love telling stories. We want to tell good stories. We don't want people to be bored. We don't want people to, um, you know, not consider us, not, not so much not consider us good, but just not consider us relevant or not consider us as part of that that conversation when it comes to to literature. And it's it's been a recurring theme, like I said, the last several years. It's been a recurring theme even in in you know the work that I do outside of writing. I'm always thinking, am I doing this right? Is this the right thing? I bet you someone else is doing something different. Why are they working twelve hours and I'm only working eight? You know, what what am I doing wrong? So um I think it's important because we all feel that. I think it's 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 crucial that we add some of those elements into our work. You know, the best part of reading a book is being able to connect with the character. If your character is feeling something that is normal, your your reader is going to connect with that even more and no matter how fantastic the plot is, they're going to barrel through because they want to see what that individual does because they've now got this this one-on-one -on -one connection with them. So adding those elements, um, the imposter syndrome, you know, Cassidy has dealt with a, 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 a lot of trauma in her life and she's still finding ways to navigate through that. She has um, some challenges, you know, in the first book, especially she had challenges with, with painkillers and because she's an empath and she feels everyone's emotions and they were so debilitating she had to use painkillers to try to ease some of that pain and she, you know, developed a bit of an addiction to it. So she, she has to navigate those waters as well. And all of those things make her real. All of those things put that, that realistic slant on her so that, you know, the fact that she is an empath, the fact that she is a reaper, um, you know, those things don't seem as crazy because you're able to connect with her because you, she's got more human elements than fantastic elements. So yeah, adding that adding that layer of that imposter syndrome, I think, adds again to that realism and helps the reader more, you know, more connect with with what she's going through. I completely agree. I mean, your characters are for the most part gods or immortals living in yeah. Chicago, <laughs> and and you know, <laughs> you, you know, and it's you know, just that sentence laying there is like what. But as you dig into the story and you get to meet all these characters, you realize that these gods are more human than we mm -hmm. would assume, and especially than they would, especially more so than they would assume. And um, you know, these people who are hundreds, if not thousands, of years old, I totally identified with. And yeah. that's one of the things I think I like most about your writing is that your characters are so beautifully flawed, and they just they feel like somebody you'd meet at your local pub and mm -hmm. um i'm not sure you'd want to meet all of them at your local pub but <laughs> especially at the same time <laughs> oh god <laughs> better be armed with bourbon but <laughs> but you know it's just it's so nice to be able to experience stories like that where yeah. you're not questioning you're, you're so enveloped in this in the story of what's going to happen to this character that you identify with that you're not questioning the fantastical elements and mm -hmm. I've definitely read books where that that human connection isn't there. Exactly. And that takes away from the story. And um, so one of the things that I really appreciated that Cassidy is doing without necessarily realizing it is building this family around her and her community that's around her. And I know that mm -hmm. she's trying to push them away because that's her defense mechanism. Very much so. She's, yeah, she's very, you know, as, and I think it, it goes back to her being the empath, mm -hmm. you know, the closer she gets to people, the more she experiences what they're feeling. And she's, she's at a better place now where she can manage what she's experiencing through them. Right. But it's still, 
but still a lot. And yeah, I think she definitely wants that community because she's never really felt it. You know, she's had it, but she's always pushed it away despite wanting it so badly. And I think for her that, you know, her next several adventures are really going to be coming to terms with that piece and trying to figure out how to balance, you know, that need uh, versus the fear, you know, of, of getting close to someone, of letting someone in and, and, and really having that connection that helps you get through life stressors. Which is a very relevant topic for a lot of people yeah. and something that a lot of us, um, you know, even if just subconsciously may identify with. And, mm-hmm. you know, that that sense of building community or that importance of it. You know, I read your book all the way through to the acknowledgement section. And one of the things you said in there was about the importance of building a community and how much that's mm-hmm. meant. And I think, you know, right now we're, we're in the back and forth of, ah, we'll be in quarantine. Oh, we won't be. Oh, we're going to shut down again. Oh, we won't be. Having mm-hmm. those human connections now is so important. And um, you want to talk about how much being a part of the writing community has meant to you? It's changed my life. You know, I have, I've been in San Diego seven years now. <clears throat> And I, you know, I came in knowing that I wanted to continue writing, but still <laughs> not really knowing how. And meeting people in the writing community, it did two things. One, it helped me realize that I'm not the only one that that struggles with that. You know, I think at all levels, we're still trying to perfect our craft. We're trying to learn something, trying to learn something new. And so meeting people in the writing community here helped me realize that I'm I'm not alone in that. It also helped to inspire me because as I saw folks doing well, you know, uh, getting short stories published, uh, getting their books published, getting agents, um, you know, whatever it was that they were doing, starting a blog, starting a podcast, um, whatever they were doing, it inspired me to do more. It's like, wow, look what they're doing. I want to do that. I'm going home right now. I'm going to keep the writing. And, and I would, and I would use that as, as motivation. I would use that as motivation to not only write, but to learn more about the craft of writing and the business of publishing. Uh, you know, you've been a big inspiration to me. Um, a lot of the people that we've met within that, that writer's coffee house community, all of those folks have, have been an inspiration to me. That's why I continue to go to those meetings so often. Now they're online because we can't get together, you know, in person. But I still go to those because I still feel that that connection and that that inspiration from what people are, are doing. And so I, I, I tell any writer that is interested, anyone that comes up to me and says, you know, I really want to write or, um, you know, where do I start? What do I do? I always say, you know, the best thing to do is to try to get involved in a community. And I give them some ideas of where they can go uh, to find that, invite them, you know, to the groups that I'm in because it's so crucial. And I think it just helps you, helps you grow, Mm -hmm. you know, grow as a person, grow as a, as an artist, um, you know, really kind of taps into that creativity and causes you to, to think outside the box, you know, consider things that you may not have considered before. Um, It's just been without the community, I wouldn't have these books, you know, without that community, I, I wouldn't have gone to my first writer's conference. I wouldn't have met, you know, the publisher that I started working with. I wouldn't have met a number of writers that have helped me along the way and, and kind of given me that guidance. Um, so, yeah, building that community is is so important, I think, for any creative. It's such a solitary <laughs> thing that we do. As right? we're in our armchair unless with our whiskey, yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, <laughs> unless you're collaborating with someone on a book, you know, your your book is your baby. It's you and those characters. And you know, you need that, you need that connection outside of that to, to kind of help balance that, that solitude, you know? So yeah, you, you have to build that community. I think that that is crucial toward um, success, motivation, inspiration, and, and ultimately sanity. <laughs> it's, yeah, my gosh. I mean, I, I can't echo that enough. I mean, the last year, ironically being in you know shutdown and quarantine 
I have met so many different people, so many different writers yeah. and authors and creatives like this via Zoom or, you know, what have you. And my writing has grown so much okay. over that last year because, you know, I'm able to discuss things, exactly. talk scenes out. I mean, I think I had a discussion with you and Teresa Halverson at a um, book lunch party we had a couple months ago. And that really affirmed for me an idea I had for Blue Dragon Society, which I'd been going back and forth with and I didn't know what I was going to mm -hmm. do. But just having one conversation yes, I yes. just really helped to set me on track for this story. And, and that's one example. Exactly. And it's so true. I mean, it's you can't be it's hard because not all of us are extroverts and you right. know, I am definitely an extrovert. <laughs> so it's a little bit easier. For <laughs> and me. see, I, I am the opposite of that. I, I am an introvert with extrovert tendencies. I, I am very much that inch. I can be an extrovert, but once I'm done with that, I need like two days <laughs> to, <laughs> to recover. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, you know, it, it's, you you have to you have to balance that out. I yeah. think even extroverts, you know, you kind of need that that introvert balance sometimes. I I think I don't know. <laughs> do you do you guys get tired or sometimes, but not often. <laughs> it's the coffee though. It's just but <laughs> it's that. <laughs> Well, Dennis, you know, thank you so much for answering these. We have a couple more questions here, and these are from yeah. our listeners, and this was submitted on TikTok. So the good old, good old TikTok. Uh, <laughs> author <laughs> Isabel Marcus wants to know, are there elements of real life in your book? And if so, what? Um, yes. So I think every character has some element of people that I know. There are there's certainly elements of me in every character, especially Cassidy. Uh, there are elements of friends that I've known, um, that I've grown up with, a few family members here and there. There's at least in, in Death's Debt, there is one character that is actually a real person. Um, and it, the book's actually dedicated to him. Um, there are locations within the book that are real places. And, you know, it, 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 it's about kind of that grounding piece too, you know? It's about setting it. It's urban fantasy, and I want to make sure that it's not just fantasy. So I get to the urban part, and I put in elements of Chicago, elements of Oak Park, the town that I grew up in. Uh, I, sometimes I might change a name or, or, or two of a, of a location. But there are definitely some some real places and real people um, in this book. In fact, in Death's Legacy, there were three chapters that were death scenes. All three of those people are people I know. Um, the first one, the it's not a spoiler. You guys have to read the book now because you <laughs> have to find this out. The first the first death scene was uh, Derek James, a paramedic. Uh, Derek James is actually my son. My son is not a paramedic. But in this book, he was. Um, I apologized to him afterwards for killing him in my book. He says, you killed me? I said, yeah, but it's okay. It's fantasy. You know, I can always bring you back like in book five or six or something. So don't worry about it. Um, the character of uh, Jane, the woman who was like, you know, a stickler with the time in the morning. She was getting ready for work. She's a, a person that I know in real life. And then... Um, uh, ben, the Marine, is actually a writer that I know from the coffee house. He's on the East Coast now, but he was out here in San Diego. He's an actual Marine, um, and he agreed to be killed in my novel. But I wanted to make sure that he got an honorable death because he is a Marine, and he deserves that. And I made sure of that. So, yeah. So, yes, there are elements of real life, um, not only in the characters. Sometimes they are characters. Uh, sometimes it's in the scenery. It's in the it, it's it's where the scene is located. I think that's just important because again, it helps people connect to the story and to the characters. And I'll continue to do that. I'll. I, I have a friend who just um, actually moved from San Diego out to Oklahoma. God, I'm awful with this. Oh my God. <laughs> well, he left anyway, and he's opening up like his own coffee shop. So. 
that coffee shop will be featured, you know, at some point, either in a short story or a book that I write. I just like pulling those pieces in and, and really grounding the book into something that's real. I love that. And I, I love using the world that surrounds us as inspiration. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's a little bit tougher as a fantasy writer. Um, but <laughs> um, I, that's something I generally suggest um, when people ask me for writing tips is, you know, how do I get started or what do I do? And I, I recommend to them, just look at the world around you. Look Absolutely. at your friends, look at your family like you've done. And um, I, I think that's fantastic advice for anybody who's getting started or even who's somebody who's really established. It's, it's a yeah. great tool at your immediate disposal to use. And I guess my natural subsequent uh, question is, what do I have to do to get killed off in one of your novels? I mean, that sounds like a great Just say, honor. hey, um, <laughs> put me in the next one and kill me, please. I actually, <laughs> I wrote on Facebook, I said, I've got to kill some people in my novel. Who wants to die? Literally, that's that was great kind marketing. of the, the post I put. Yeah. And I had, I don't know, I said the first five people, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll probably kill you off and those were, except for my son, I think I'd already written that scene. <laughs> <laughs> I needed some extra people. Um, so I took those folks in and, and yeah, I gave two some actual scenes and then a couple other people were just mentioned as having having died. Well, you know, I, I'm going to volunteer myself for whatever story you'd like to put in a death scene. I think it'd be if you fun. volunteer as tribute, then hey, we got we got you covered. <laughs> We will we will take care of that too sweet. Yes, get to die in a novel. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you immortal, right? You know, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you something else about the the realism piece. So, if you are a a storyteller, I think what helps you tell a relevant story, what tells you, what kind of is it alleviates some of that imposter syndrome, is putting in those elements that you know mm-hmm. well. That's yeah. Several years ago, a whole other life, I was a private investigator. And during that time, you know, we, as a private investigator, in order to get information, oftentimes you have to pretend to be someone else. And, you know, kind of, we call it the pretext. So you are misrepresenting yourself in order to get information that you need to further your investigation. And any pretext I used was always rooted in something that I knew well, or something that I had researched. Um, so I often use my background in retail, you know, having worked at, at Home Depot or I read the paper every morning. And I, if I'd see an article in there, I would, you know, utilize something, some aspect of that article, maybe in the pretext. But if you root it in something that, you know, you feel more confident in it and you're willing to just kind of let that story flow. And I think that helps a lot in my writing as well. So when I pull in real people or when I pull in areas of Chicago or Oak Park that I know well, I feel more connected to the story and the story just flows. It almost writes itself. Mm -hmm. It's telling me where it wants to go. Um, So that's I think that's another crucial element is, you know, bring in that realism because it's really going to help you help that story and and kind of solidify your own security within that. I, I totally agree with that. I, when I wrote The Complex, which was sort of my, my therapy book um, during 2020, <laughs> um, I it takes place in San Diego, you know, my hometown, yeah. and in a neighborhood that I've been through, you know, countless times. And that oh. made the setting just so easy to write. You know, I didn't have to do a ton of world building. You know, sure. it was just all right there at my disposal. And Exactly. You know, another that's a great tip if uh, listeners for you guys that just write what's if you're having a hard time, look to what you know and draw mm-hmm. inspiration from that. Absolutely. So our next question here is from David Green, and I absolutely love this because I couldn't answer this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, how many of your signature drinks do you have on average while writing? <laughs> I think word count to drink ratio is pretty accurate. So <laughs> that that is interesting. So here's the thing. When I, when I write, I had a hard time during the pandemic writing because I could not write at hmm. home. I was always used to writing uh, so cliche. Cafes? You know, I'm a writer. I go to cafes and coffee shops. <laughs> Who does that? 
I would be, you know, in Starbucks, I'd be in Lestat's, I would be in some coffee shop writing. Um, and it was, like I said, it's, it's so terribly cliche, but it was, that's just how it went. And, and once I could not go to those places, I would have to sit at my, my table in, in my apartment and try to write. And it was just so hard to do. <laughs> Until I got my gaming chair, which was inspired by you. <laughs> yes, the gaming chair. <laughs> you went off, you got the gaming chair, I went and got it. And once I got it, I was like, oh my God, I'm a writing demon. This is amazing. <laughs> this is this is There's so wonderful. something about the chair. <laughs> it just opens everything up. <laughs> so I was able to write at home. And I typically write like mid-morning to afternoon. And there's no signature drink drinking during that time however i may make some coffee i may or may not put baileys in the coffee (laughs) on occasion um so I, i wouldn't call that a signature drink per se but if i'm writing at night so if i'm home typically my writing at night comes toward the end of the novel when i've got just a few chapters left or when I've thought of an idea or maybe a plot hole and I need to go back and fix something, that typically happens at night because while I'm supposed to be working, I'm thinking about what's wrong with my book, <laughs> as everybody does. Yeah. So I'd come home, I'd sit down, and I'd do that. And I would say I probably on a writing night, no more than two drinks because I still have to get up and go to work the next oh, day. Oh, that whole thing, yeah. Um, that thing. <laughs> So probably, yeah, probably no more than two drinks. And um, if, if that, if that, and it, even sometimes that would, would really depend on how late I was writing or, you know, what else was happening around that writing. You know, if I had to you know, write and then like leave it out again right away, I might not have a drink. I would just go ahead and, and start, you know, start in on it, finish it up, take off and come home. Uh, but yeah, I would say probably no more than two on a night, especially on a weeknight. Weekends, I try to leave for myself. Um, I might write in the mornings on Saturdays and Sundays, but I will not write after that. I try to leave the rest of that as like downtime and, and me time and, you know, hit the cigar lounge and watch some sports on TV. That sounds like a great day. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know, it's, I like that you said that. Um, as somebody who no longer has a traditional schedule, um, you know, I would try to bang out as many words as I could in the evenings. And, mm-hmm. you know, usually I wasn't able to get to writing until you know, nine, ten o'clock. So I, yeah. I, I'm not drinking at that time on a Monday night Uh, and so you know I definitely hear you on that and um when I would do the weekend warrior thing as well trying to maintain that healing time uh, you know to call it something like that because we we do have jobs we do have lives we do have relationships and everything in between that we have to balance as well And it's so important and it's hard to find a balance. And I I don't think there's any one formula for it, but maintaining that mental health is so Mm -hmm. important because we get so wrapped up and, oh my God, I have to finish this. You know, whoever author just released another book, I have to catch up with them. Yeah, exactly. We're, We're again, comparing ourselves to other people when we only have to compare ourselves to the writer we were yesterday. Oh, I love that. You know, am I, am I better than what I was yesterday? Is this book better than what it was last week? Is this story better than the last story that I wrote? You know, we, we have to stop comparing and competing. You know, we, we are all kind of in this pot together as creatives. And there is absolutely no problem with lifting one other, one another up and, feeling inspiration for one another as opposed to trying to you know compete or step over or feel like you're lesser than you know you're you're you picked up a pen this morning and you started writing you are a writer that's that's just how it goes i totally agree and um that that whole perception of am i a writer am i an author like you said you wrote something you're an author you're a Mm -hmm. writer you don't have to be traditionally published you don't have to have an agent exactly (laughs) I tell you, I struggled with that up until like like last year, probably. No, yeah, yeah, early last year, 
my mother kept telling me that, you know, she kept introducing me to her friends as an author. I'm like, I'm not an author yet. I haven't been published. And in my head, that's what you had to right. be in order to be an author. And as I thought about it more, I'm like, no, I, I authored that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. If it's not for sale, I don't care. I still did it. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm past that now. So, yeah. So our last question here tonight comes from Jen Roberts. And the question is, how much sleep do you get when writing a book? Like, do you wake up in the <laughs> middle of the night and start writing? Mine is definitely it. <laughs> I think I answered her on TikTok something to the effect of authors don't sleep. I, mean, <laughs> I haven't. Listen, let me tell you something about sleep. Sleep and I are like those cousins that had a fight when you're like preteens and you haven't spoken since <laughs> that's, that's, that's my relationship with sleep. I haven't had a, the last good night sleep I had was July, 2014 um, at a La Quinta Inn in Utah, Salt Lake city, Utah. I was driving out here. I was moving from Chicago to California. I was on my way out here. I stopped off there for a night. I had the best night's sleep ever. This bed was just amazing. It was soft. It was huge. It was just, oh my God, it was so amazing. Um, I don't sleep well traditionally because my mind is kind of always going. I am terrible with taking notes. So I'll wake up from a dream and I'm like, man, that's a good idea. I'm going to write that today. And then I won't write it down and I'll get in the shower and I'll get out. And I'm like, what was that I was going to write down? <laughs> So, you know, my, my sleep issues are, are separate from my writing. I take notes throughout the course of the day. I have, I'm looking at my counter right now. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten notebooks there. I've got two more in my bag. So I'm always writing notes. Every, every notebook is for a specific mm. story or for a specific character. So whatever I'm working on, I make sure I keep those notebooks with me. And if I have an idea, I will write them down. I try, again, I try my best to kind of shut down at, in the evening so that I can really get some good sleep. Um, I might have an idea and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and write it down or I'll put a, like a little note in my phone or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, sleep and I are, are estranged for a lot of reasons, not just because of writing. I was going to say, it might be because you have so many characters in your head just floating around up there. It, it could be. <laughs> I mean... 14 what what is it yeah too many journals too many characters everyone wants their book everyone wants their book out now um, our characters are selfish <laughs> i know they are selfish and what i've done is <laughs> so i can let them shut up for a minute <laughs> i've incorporated some of them into these books in death's legacy the first novel i ever wrote and it's bad. It's it's so bad. It's and it's sitting waiting for me to rewrite it now that I know a little bit more. But the first uh, novel I wrote was a vampire novel, featuring London James, Ooh. who is the private investigator that Cassidy knows. Um, she's the kind of the, the the one that got her involved with um, the first case she was working in the in the beginning of Legacy, um, and she also linked her up with another individual that gets introduced in Death's Debt. So. Yeah, I, I, I incorporated her into that book so that I could at least quiet her down and let the world know that she exists. <laughs> um, there is There are two characters in Death's Debt that will get their own um, novels as well. They'll get their own stories eventually. Like the one that, that London introduces Cassidy to. Um, and then uh, the character Jason Lucas, the advocate. He was in the first novel. He's back in this novel. I wrote my first short story featuring him back in 2013. Wow. I haven't really figured out what to do with him yet. So I've just been kind of throwing him in these novels as this enigmatic, enigmatic character. This just kind of mystery guy that nobody knows, you know, really what's the deal. Cause that's kind of how he's been with me. I don't really know what to do with him. <laughs> I just know that I like him as a character. I want to give him something solid, you know, to work with. So I wonder who um, yeah, could play that... him if you cast that. <laughs> <laughs> if only there were yes, some indeed. subtle hints. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he looks like. 
<laughs> you have to read it to find out. <laughs> Well, Dennis, this has been absolutely wonderful as always. It's such a joy always getting to talk to you. And again, I'm so grateful to having been one of the people to get to read Death's Dead before it came out. And I want to encourage every single one of you listeners to go ahead and pick up Death's Legacy and Death's Debt if you haven't done so yet. And Dennis, if you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about how people can find you. Um, I am all over... Not all over. Let me stop that. I'm not internationally known. Let me let me not get too big for my britches. I am on Instagram. I am on Instagram a lot. Um, that's probably the best place to find me, um, at Dennis K. Crosby. Uh, I am on Facebook, same place, at Dennis K. Crosby, same place on Twitter. Uh, but I spend most of my time kind of between Instagram and, and Facebook. I also have a website, uh, DennisKCrosby.com. Uh, you can get to all of my other linkages from there. Um, I share my interviews on there. I share um, interviews that I've conducted, interviews that I've been in. Um, there's some there's some fun content there, some fun photos, which I have to update, by the way, because I've done some new things since then. So um, yeah, that's that's the best place to find me. So guys, be sure to follow Dennis on all of his different social media, especially Instagram, as he said. And I'll be sure to include all of that in our show notes below. And for you YouTubers out there, those will be in the description box below. I want to thank you guys again for listening so much. This has been awesome. And Dennis, again, thank you for joining us. And cheers. Can't, can't thank you enough for having me. It's been a pleasure. Cheers to you. 